Hello once again, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary friends, and welcome back to another week here of Gaming Nest News on Nest HQ. It's Joker once again here with you, bringing you the news that you want to know coming up here this week. First up, we're going to toss it on over to Richard, our producer. He's got another big piece for us today, but this time he's taking a look at some of the pricing that's been going on here in the gaming world and especially what Microsoft has been doing recently. You might have heard that they were looking at increasing the price of their Xbox Live Gold and then decided to back away from that decision. We'll go ahead and send it on over to Richard so we can take an in-depth look at exactly what has been going on. If you've been watching any gaming news sites, you've probably seen that Microsoft has increased the price of Xbox Live Gold to approximately double its original price, from $59.99 US dollars for one year to instead only six months. After a public outcry, they did in fact reverse this decision and ensured that any game with a free online component like Fortnite or the upcoming Halo Infinite multiplayer will not require a gold subscription. Besides the fact that the new Xbox costs a lot of money, it doesn't even have very many interesting online multiplayer games at the moment, and shelling out another $120 a year on top of that is just not jiving with gamers at the moment. In fact, this mostly seems like a ploy to get people into buying Games Pass and selling the value of the quote-unquote free games accessible through the service at that slight premium over that of the cost of gold itself. I, myself, attempted to purchase a year of gold off their website last year and found that it instead converted my $60 Canadian one-year pass into four months of Games Pass Ultimate automatically without my knowledge or consent. Now, they don't even offer the one-year option on their website anymore, and you'd have to purchase that in the form of those subscription cards from retailers like GameStop during a global pandemic, where businesses like GameStop shouldn't be open anyway because video games aren't exactly an essential business service. But I digress. Microsoft's original reasoning was that and I quote, In many markets, the price of the Xbox Live Gold has not changed for years, and in some markets, it hasn't changed for over 10 years. Microsoft had planned to hike the fees to $10.99 for one month, $29.99 for three months, and $59.99 for six months, respectively. This would have doubled the price of an annual membership to just under $120, as I had mentioned, which is now twice the cost of PlayStation Plus, and six times the cost of Nintendo Switch Online. The idea that video games are an ever-increasingly expensive business venture is, as we have seen time and time again now, absolutely horse hockey. Publishers such as Electronic Arts have been as money-hungry as possible since their insidious insertion of microtransactions in both their major series and smaller titles, and thus have destroyed beloved franchises in the process in pursuit of just a little bit more. No, I will not forgive them for what happened to Dead Space. They deserve so much better than 5 million copies? To continue the franchise? That's absolute bullshit! I recently heard on the Insert Credit podcast that Nintendo can apparently stand to be at a loss for something like 40 straight years before they even have to worry about going bankrupt, and that doesn't surprise me in the least. Companies have a lot of money, a lot of capital, so I wouldn't doubt if it was much more than Nintendo that had that staying power. Microsoft similarly has their own hardware, software, studios, and dozens of other tech products offered besides video games. So the drive to pull in double the money from their player base every year is nothing but greed. I highly doubt that money is going to server maintenance and the like to improve user experiences. To highlight this point further, let's take a look at a game with no microtransactions and see if the cost of development is outweighed by the relative sales success worldwide. Now, I will be rounding and approximating this information with the cost of US dollars, so the number will be slightly skewed, but bear with me. 
In The Last of Us 2, a game we have heard so many things about these last few months, that had gone on record as selling 4 million copies worldwide within the game's first three days of release. Development time over the past bunch of years leads to a speculative cost of about 100 million US dollars. So taking that 4 million copies that they sold in the first three days and multiplying that by the US standard of $60 a copy brings us to about 240 million dollars. The game raked in about 2.4 times its own budget in the first three days of its release. That has nothing to do with marketing costs or anything else. I'm not sure if the marketing cost is tied directly to development costs, but either way, two and a half times almost in the first three days. Now I know that isn't exactly precise, and different countries have different pricing models for their games, i.e. Australia costing a minimum of $120 per game, and taking into account exchange rates and the like, which Australia still translates to about 9 US dollars per game. For a single player experience with no additional ways to wring money out of their consumers, it's impressive to say the least. The game continues to smash sales records as the year went on, so it made even more money. But what happens when you try to get blood from a stone? Have your consumers pay full price for a game and then continue to nickel and dime them for everything they have so they can even just continue playing. Take-Two Interactive's NBA 2K20 is infamous for having a terrible pay-to-win scheme tied to its own multiplayer sections, with loot boxes and surprise mechanics designed to keep you spending and spending additional dollars just to keep up with your friends, let alone try to have any successful presence online. We've seen similar hooks come from Clash of Clans and similar mobile games where you're practically forced to pay real-world currency or wait for time to pass, and in the latter case you're usually completely demolished by your opponent. The same rings true here. And despite being about an average virtual basketball experience, it still sells upwards of 14 million units. Base profit? That's 840 million dollars. It doesn't matter what the development cost is at that point, considering Take-Two just kind of slaps a new number on their sports games year after year, but even without counting microtransactions, that number is staggering. Take-Two's press release is gloated at the fact that within one year from one game, they had made over one billion dollars. It's sickening, it's maddening, it's disgusting, and I won't even get into how other publishers mismanage and destroy their beloved IP's credibility in a similar fashion just for a quick buck. Okay, maybe just one. Remember how in Star Wars Battlefront 2, when you wanted one playable character, it would take you upwards of 40 hours for one character? Just to grind out the in-game currency for it for one character? With, like, people with jobs and lives and can only play for maybe three or four hours a day, 40 hours for one character? At the time, the cost of 60,000 credits took you 40 hours of gameplay in order to earn the right to unlock one character. That means 40 hours of saving each and every credit. That's no buying any loot crates or loot boxes at all, so you don't even get bonus credits from getting duplicates. And worse, Battlefront 2's microtransaction economy is worse than that found in NBA 2K20s. And at least in Battlefront 2, you're not trying to grind out perfect stats on a 5-star LeBron character or whatever the hell you want to call it, just so you can play the game slightly better than you did 5 minutes ago before you had the character in order to keep up with people online. It's ridiculous. But on the flip side, Genshin Impact a free-to-play Breath of the Wild clone by Chinese developer MiHoYo costs nothing to start, and yet somehow rakes in almost six million dollars every day. There's something to be said about the thirst of anime fans, but this is still an incredible figure. Analysts have speculated that this free-to-play game has raked in about 400 million dollars in its first two months alone. And if you haven't heard about Fate Grand Order, a mobile game that was spawned from a terrible light novel where you collect JPEGs of your favorite gender bent history and mythology characters, has recently made a lifetime 4 billion JPEG dollars last year. At least in Genshin Impact, you can see the model of the character you paid for. These are just cards. 
and it's making more money than God. And these are free to play games. Fortnite Battle Royale has been free to play since its inception and dominates the market as well. Rocket League went free to play within the last few months and the player base is still as strong as ever. And even Microsoft is going to dip its toe into offering Halo Infinite's multiplayer portion for free. The risk of trying a free game and spending a few dollars on it is almost zero for a consumer. And that's why these things do gangbusters. It's just slimy and immoral when you also have to see these marketing schemes shoved onto full AAA release titles just to ensure that they secure your hard-earned dollar before somebody else does. And then the next dollar you earn, and the next dollar you earn, in an endless cycle. With the release of the PS5 and the Xbox Series X, people in the industry have pushed for a price increase of games from the standard $60 to $70. Most people buy digital anyway, so it isn't offsetting costs for physical copies, which aren't even that expensive to press and ship out in the grand scheme of things anyway. The price hike is just another round of corporate greed clutching at your pockets, trying to get a hold of your wallet and hoping you won't notice if a buck or six goes missing every time you boot up a video game and see something flashy and cool in the in-game advertisements for in-game cosmetics and the like that they push on their own title screen. Video games have no reason to cost this much. But when a company makes all the money in the world and the investors then say, well, we want a 15% increase next year. They oblige, because they want their filthy, greedy little hands and every dime that they can too. The CEOs and higher-ups like Andrew Wilson and Bobby Kotick make millions and millions of dollars in bonuses every year because of increasing sales numbers. And not enough or none of those bonuses are going to the people actually working on those games themselves. And despite the fact that they don't actually do anything for production outside of exists at the top of the company's food chain, they make the most. Even if video games cost half of the price, they would still turn a massive, disgusting profit. No issues, hands down. Mostly even without microtransactions. And if games did cost half the price, maybe it would be different spending a few dollars on a new character or a cool skin, because then we as consumers can budget for that. Or even if there was a universal minimum wage so that we could afford to live and spend money on entertainment as we please, but I don't need Google's help to tell me wages have stagnated for years and we're entering another global recession, meaning the likelihood of that happening just gets slimmer and slimmer every day. An extra $10 on top of what we already pay is just the icebreaker. Because then when we get used to paying just a bit more, that standard has changed. And then they can shovel another $10 on top of that new price tag. This is more than just greed. This is conditioning. When it comes to the cost of buying video games, we've always had the option of voting with our dollar. But within the last 10 years, that prospect has seen a smaller and smaller effect on the industry. So maybe it's finally time to unionize. Companies love to say games aren't political, but that doesn't mean we can't be. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a guillotine to build. See you next week. Thanks again, Richard, for taking a look at that here for us, because it is pretty interesting uh, to understand how video games have uh, evolved in terms of pricing. You know, games used to be fairly cheap or at least provide a lot of entertainment uh, for the dollar value. And then now you start to get games that are still being priced out at $50, $60 and coming out as incomplete games or not really providing the dollar value entertainment uh, for that price. So, you know, it's it's an ever evolving change, ever growing change. So thank you for taking a look at that for us and, you know, at least letting us know exactly what's going on behind the scenes there at Microsoft. Coming up next, we're going to toss it on over to the boys at Project Supervillain. They've got a pretty nice list of games to take a look at that are releasing here in February, coming up very, very soon. So Arc Drifter, Kill Boss, let's see what you've got in store for us. What's going on, everybody? We're your hosts from Project Supervillain, back with some more news. 
I'm Arc Drifter. I'm Kill Boss. Today we're coming at you with the top five best games releasing in February. That's this upcoming February. I'm not talking about next year or last year or whatever. This is the one coming up in 2021. And we've got five pretty amazing games here and one honorable mention as well. So let's just get into it. So the first game that we're going to be taking a look at today is Werewolf the Apocalypse Earthblood. That'll be coming out February 4th, all major platforms. Uh, if you take a look at some of the gameplay videos, you can see all this stuff here, but it's a third person action RPG. Uh, it's going to have a lot of different mechanics in it. So you got your stealth mechanics, you'll have uh, interaction and social interactions with the environment and the people inside the world and each one of the forms that you have human werewolf and regular wolf those will all play into each uh, single one of those sections there so you're getting a good stealth action blend with some rpg elements to it it looks to be pretty compelling to me story's a little bit cheesy but you know what i'll bite because it's an interesting looking game i at least want to give it a shot so whenever that comes out february 4th uh i think i'll be taking a look into that this is definitely one of the more lesser known games that we have on our list here i think the rest of them are a little more well known than than this one but uh let's just move on to our next one uh which is super mario 3d world uh with bowser's fury which is coming out on the switch now this was a wii u release um and that game was actually quite fun on the wii u but uh didn't play a whole heck of a lot of it because the wii u really sucked yeah <laughs> It was going to be nice about it, but yeah, no, it, it really sucked ass, so I didn't have a Wii U for very long. Um, did not have it long enough to really enjoy that game, that's for sure. So I'm going to probably get another chance to do that when it comes out on the Switch there on February 12th. Um, it's So, like I said, it's pretty much just a remaster. It's going to have some extra content, um, a lot of extra content, actually. From what I understand, this is more than just a remaster, almost. It's almost pretty much a remake. Uh, one of the newest modes being featured is the Bowser's Fury kind of like a DLC I guess um, it's like an extra add-on they stated that this is going to be a big part of the game uh, so expect a decent amount of content coming with this uh, that's fresh uh, so apparently you're playing as Mario and uh, you're also going to be playing as Bowser Jr. the second player uh, mm -hmm. it's going to have like an offline co-op thing going on there for that mode but only for, only offline only offline for that story mode but for the regular mode and then, of course, we have the classic mode, the story mode, which is four-player co-op, and that's featuring all the main characters that you know and love, Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Toad. So you can look forward to their reappearance here in this remaster. And like I said, co-op, and that's local and online, which is a new feature for this kind of game. So uh, one, yeah. of the one of the first times that they've done this for uh, this particular sort of game. Uh, Apparently they had an online mode in the Wii U version, but it was like a time trial kind of thing, and uh, just definitely doesn't compare to what this is so definitely something to look forward to on february 12th the next one we've got on the list here is destruction all stars this uh this one doesn't have an official release date but it is set to be sometime in february um so i'm assuming we're gonna get a release date really soon i swear to god if it happens before this goes up I, before this video goes up, I'm going <laughs> to... Okay, anyways. Uh, <laughs> so anyways, it's going to be on the PS5. It's an exclusive for the PS5. Um, but it's essentially like a hero shooter combined with a car demolition derby game. Minus the shooting part. Actually, wait, there is shooting. There's rockets and there's all sorts of stuff. There's like blades and, and these cards are freaking crazy man it's twisted metal basically for a new age it really is uh it hopefully will live up to what that game was because back then that game was pretty awesome i know uh, i played a little bit of it when i was a kid probably shouldn't have been but hmm. <laughs> you know um this game definitely seems to capture that uh that joy of destroying people in cars but it takes it a step further by uh, apparently you can get destroyed and still live on after you run around as a as your character who still has abilities and whatnot um outside of the car and can get back into cars and stuff like that apparently that that seems pretty cool to me so yeah like you just mentioned there will be a, a large roster of characters all with their own unique skills and vehicles uh you know different abilities that sort of thing again almost just like twisted metal but it's got a new spin on it and stuff especially with the fact you can survive after your car has been blown up uh it's gonna have a story mode and online multiplayer of course because like how could you not have that in a game like this this game is built for like having tournaments and things like that so yeah. definitely one that if you're a fan of vehicular combat you're gonna want to keep your eyes on this title right here so again no set release date yet february sometime hopefully so yeah keep your eyes open for destruction all stars that's looking to be good if you want a ps5 number two on our list here is little nightmares 2 
And this game is sequel to Little Nightmares 1, obviously. No, really? Uh, wow, yeah. Fuck I me, that. I had no clue. <laughs> it's coming out on the PC, PS4, Xbox One, um, the newer consoles as well, of course, and then the Switch. Um, so it's going to be a one-player game. I know some people were kind of speculating it might be two-player because there's supposed to be like a second character on the screen there. But it's supposed to be just an AI. I did read into this. Uh, so the story is going to revolve around you playing as this new character and the character from the previous game six is going to be like that ai controlled character that apparently helps you out throughout the story uh this game is a side scroller platformer it's really spooky it looks fucking awesome um i have to say having one player uh, like like uh just one player alone and having the ai seems like a bit of a missed opportunity for you to have like a good couch co-op game but what do I know? I'm not a game developer. I 100% agree with you. I was really hoping it would be a two-player game, but it is what it is. We got to take what we can get. I promise uh, this game is really good. If he hasn't played the first one yet, I'm actually going to get him to when we do a stream with that soon. Um, by the way, twitch.tv slash Project Supervillain. Go there if you want to join some streams. But anyways, um, yeah, very hor heavy horror themes in this game, uh, and that's coming out on February 11th, so look forward to that, guys. Cool. Now it's time for the honorable mention, and for that, we have 30XX. So this is like a huge Mega Man-inspired game. Like, you just look at it, and you're like, that's Mega Man. Totally. That's man. Mega Man. Like, it's not even trying to look like anything else. It's it's Mega like, Man. Like, look, that's Mega Man. There's zero right there. Yeah, I know. Like, they're the same, they're yeah. They're the same colors. <laughs> they are. Uh, they look the same, but it, it looks good. It's it's awesome. If you like side-scrollers, you're definitely going to have a good time with this one. Lots of shooting, jumping, platforming, like disappearing platforms and different obstacles, time platforming, gauntlets. It's it's Mega Man. They've even got a little roguelite mode in there. Local and online co-op again, so get yourself a buddy and get cracking. Mm -hmm. Level the, editor. The music sounds really amazing, too. So, mm. like, that... Honestly, like it does seem like a pretty cool spiritual successor to Mega Man, so if you like that style of gameplay and you can't wait for them to finally release another one, there you go. We'll try the 30XX releasing February 17th on the PC. Yep. All right, and capping off our list at number one is my personal favorite here, of course, Persona 5 Strikers. This is coming out on the PC, PS4, and the Switch, so uh, of course you can play it on the PS5 if you have that as well, but uh, February 23rd. I'm really excited for this because, like I said, it's a direct sequel to Persona 5. I freaking love that game. Um, of course, if you played Persona 5 Royal, which came out last year, this is not a sequel to that. It's a sequel to the original vanilla Persona 5. So that gets a little confusing if you're not a Persona 5 fan as it is. <laughs> but if you are a fan, then you will be familiar with the cast. Um, but you might not be familiar with the gameplay, which is actually a cross between Dynasty Warriors and Persona 5. So it's going to be mixing some of those uh, third-person hack-and-slash elements into uh, the Persona 5 universe, which is going to be interesting because they're apparently keeping a lot of the abilities and stuff in there as well. So almost every feature that's in Persona 5 is being carried over to this one. Obviously, they've got their new twists on gameplay, but you can expect a lot of stuff to be showing up again, especially the stealth and RPG mechanics. We all know Persona's an RPG game. It would be a miss to not include things like that in there. It's not going to be perfect. There might be a few things missing because obviously they have to make this work with a new formula, but uh, apparently they're going to try and stay true to the universe, and uh, I... I do have high hopes for it. I hope I don't get crushed. We'll see what happens. Every time I get pumped up for a game, I always get crushed. We'll see what Cyberpunk! Happens. Yeah. Oh, God, don't even get up. I have PTSD. Stop bringing it up. <laughs> so, that's going to conclude our little show for today, guys. That's our top five for February, plus a little honorable mention in there. Uh, these are just games that we're personally looking forward to, so if you've got your own, feel free to comment or whatever and do all that other fun stuff. Make sure you follow Nest, uh, National Esports Tournament, and make sure you follow us, Project Supervillain. And that's all for today, guys, so we'll see you next week. Be out. Thanks again, boys, for that list. There are a few games on there that I was not sure uh, what came out or, or, you know, what was coming out. But there were definitely a couple games that were high on my list. Obviously, if you can't tell, Persona 5 Strikers is definitely on my list of games to play. I am so excited to see that. And also, Werewolf the Apocalypse. Uh, I played in the live-action role-playing game version uh, because I am kind of a huge nerd in that way. And... It's really interesting to see what uh, the kind of world that Werewolf the Apocalypse is. Very much like a DD, and d where there's like a canon world released by the production company, by the development company itself. And then all of the homebrew or offshoot worlds that people release. So 
It'll be interesting to see what kind of world the Werewolf of the Apocalypse Earthblood will be in. That's kind of going to be a fun game to take a look at here for the future. Thanks again, Project Supervillain, for that list. Coming up next, I actually have something that I want to talk about with you guys, and that is the League of Legends uh, scene here in North America, the amateur scene. You might have remembered I updated you not too long ago on the changes to the North American amateur scene in League of Legends, and we have ourselves our first update. Uh, the first Tier 2 tournament in North American League of Legends amateur scene recently wrapped up, crowning our first tournament champion and distributing our first points towards the first Tier 1 tournament. Risen Champions League, which is organized by Risen Esports, ended on January 24th with a $6,400 prize pool being distributed amongst the top four teams. Solar Fide Esports, Evil Genius, Prodigies, Barrage, and a new Blaze duked it out in the semifinals and finals to determine who would receive the lion's share of that prize pool, as well as 100 points maxed out for the first place team towards the first Tier 1 tournament. So Lafide and Evil Genius Prodigies made it to the finals and after a grueling five-game set, so Lafide came out on top to be crowned the Risen Champions League 2021 Winter Champions. There's no rest for the wicked, however, as Big League started on January 25th with another opportunity at a large prize pool and more points towards that first Tier 1 tournament. For these four teams, they'll look to carry their momentum for their playoff finishes while other organizations and teams will look to bounce back and try to claim some glory of their own playoffs for the big league start with best of three quarterfinals on february 2nd at 8 p.m eastern can be seen at twitch.tv slash big league underscore na a lot of my personal friends and people i've worked with before will be on that broadcast it will be a fun time there at big league and a great way to break into the amateur scene if you are looking at what uh, League of Legends really entails what the competitive scene entails here in North America. So you definitely will want to tune in for that. Once again, we are asking for your submissions and your clips. Please send them in to us. We would love to broadcast and showcase what you can bring to the table. Please send any clips or info or anything that you may want to see here on uh, Gaming Nest News to info at nesthq.online. We will love to see what you have in store and love to share, share it with the rest of the world. But for the rest of the guys here at Gaming Nest News, that's going to be it for us for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Once again, please send in all your information, all those clips, uh, the videos, anything you want to see here because we would love to share it with the world. But once again, thank you guys for tuning in so much to Gaming Nest News here this week. We'll see you next week with more.